hear me calling. Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Wednesday, May 29th, 2019. St. Bob Muller made a surprise appearance before the media today. No questions. There will be no further statements from the special counsel. And he confirmed that he conducted a limited hangout investigation, as I have been suggesting. It was a bizarre performance, unannounced, really, as of, uh, well, 2.30 Eastern time, which is when I went to sleep last night. There was no indication that Bob Mueller was going to address anybody today. And then as I woke up, I learned that at 11 a.m. he was going to go into an auditorium at the Justice Department and deliver a statement to reporters. Now... The only explanation I can offer is that Bill Barr, who is the personal attorney general to Mr. Trump, is in Alaska. <laughs> and, uh, there is an indication that the White House got notification late last night that Mueller was going to speak. And so the circumstances are weird because as recently as a couple of days ago, Jerry Nadler talked about how he was in negotiations, or at least discussions, with Mueller to appear before the House Judiciary Committee, but that Mueller was setting some pretty stiff conditions. That he'd give a statement in public, and then he would answer questions behind closed doors. That apparently won't be happening, because Mueller, who came out and essentially spoke in code, he unexonerated Trump, he affirmed the evidence-free assertions, you know, that the Russian military intelligence people hacked the DNC and gave that material to WikiLeaks. The language he used is very carefully constructed. And in a moment, we'll go through the comments that Mueller delivered. But the bottom line here is that while he may feel that he offered the public some tea leaves that can be read. I think that he left the situation as confused as it was before he opened his mouth. So he said he is resigning from the Department of Justice to return to private, and he paused. I think he was thinking private practice, but he said private life. He says, let me begin where the order to the special counsel begins, interference in the 2016 presidential election. Now, listen to this language carefully crafted. As alleged by the grand jury in an indictment. So he's not stating this as fact. It's an allegation. Russian intelligence officers who are part of the Russian military launched a concerted attack on our political system. The indictment alleges that they use sophisticated cyber techniques to hack into computers and networks used by the Clinton campaign. They stole private information and then released that information through fake online identities and through the organization WikiLeaks. Now, these are all assertions based on allegations from the grand jury. And I'll bet you $5 right here, right now, that we're not going to find any major news organization who parses this statement the way I'm doing right now and suggests to you that there is no evidence available to the public to support these assertions. And these are the same damn assertions that started in October of 2016 in the intelligence assessment, were repeated in January of 2017 in an intelligence assessment, and it's been treated as fact by the corporate media ever since. They're not curious. They're not skeptical. They don't need evidence because, hey, it's been repeatedly asserted. All right. Mueller continues. The releases were designed in time to interfere with our election and to damage a presidential candidate. They were designed. Did they achieve that goal? He's not saying. At the same time as the grand jury alleged in a separate indictment, a private Russian entity engaged in a social media operation where Russian citizens posed as Americans in order to influence an election. 
These indictments contain allegations who were not commenting on the guilt or the innocence of any specific defendant. Every defendant is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. What? So he references the troll farm in St. Petersburg. And he would lead you to believe that they had direct influence and brainwashed American voters to elect Trump instead of Clinton. And then he goes into the boilerplate that every defendant is presumed innocent. But he uses his indictments as proof of the allegations. And that is circular logic that is accepted by... <laughs> Far too many political leaders and media figures. Uh, quoting again from Mr. Mueller, the indictments allege and other activities in our report describe efforts to interfere in our political system. They needed to be investigated and understood. That is also a reason we investigated efforts to obstruct the investigation. The matters we investigated were of paramount importance. It was critical for us to open full and accurate information from uh, obtain full and accurate information from every person we question. Well, then why didn't you question Trump? Why didn't you question Julian Assange? Why didn't you depose Bill Binney? And where's Stefan Halper? Where are the people from Fusion GPS? Well, they didn't fall under Mr. Mueller's radar. And that is another basis for my claim that this is a limited hangout investigation. So he mostly focuses on the obstruction issues. And, as I say, he unexonerated the president. After the investigation, if we had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. So what he's saying here is that Trump is not, not guilty. And he is providing, if you interpret it the way, you know, if you can read his mind the way I think he wants us to read it, that he did not exonerate Trump and that that claim is bullshit. But by using this vague and indirect language, the double negatives, he leaves people more confused, and it allows Trump to manipulate the language. Trump responded to Mueller's statement with two words on Twitter, case closed. <laughs> and so Mueller is the problem here. That's why I deride him as St. Bob. He's a Republican. He's a former FBI director who presided over a corrupt era when people were railroaded into prison behind phony charges time and time again. And just a single case, the one of Sibel Edmonds, Bob Mueller was directly responsible for ignoring her reports of a mole in the FBI translation unit who tried to flip Sibel to become an agent for the nation of Turkey. And instead of investigating, exposing, and indicting people for that, he drummed Sibel Edmonds out of the FBI and got John Ashcroft, the attorney general, to put a gag order on her. That's the real Bob Mueller. And so <laughs> when we see him make a statement only on his terms, telling us that uh, he's not going to talk anymore, essentially saying that he will decide that he's not going to testify before the Congress. He's not going to take any questions at any time. He said if he did go and testify, he would simply refer to the report. And so this is haughty, arrogant behavior by the special, special counsel. He's dictating the terms of what might follow. And if the Democrats had the cojones, they would be issuing a subpoena today to require him to testify. So the New York Times take on this. Mueller, in first comments on Russia inquiry, declines to clear, uh, uh, yeah, declines to clear Trump. <laughs> 
Now, that is accurate. But that is the strange takeaway, in my view, from his statement today. Oh, he also said that he was grateful to Bill Barr for releasing the vast majority of the document and that he doesn't have any doubts about his integrity or something to that effect. So this is a thoroughly unsatisfying moment. And I had never invested a great deal in the Mueller investigation and its outcome. As you know, i pretty skeptical still of part one, but I do fully embrace part two about obstruction of justice. And just to give you an example of how corporate media minds view this, Michael Tomaski, who's a bright man, I had drinks with him one time, a little smug, He's got an op-ed in the New York Times already today. And he says that Mueller's problem is that he has standards that are much too high for this era. What we saw on display in Mueller's nine-minute statement was his often-discussed sense of rectitude and propriety. That's an act. And most people, (laughs) because he looks like Robert De Niro... They just take it all at face value. Here's another quote from Tomaski. Uh, And that is the Robert Mueller who didn't want to be seen as being part of anything too political. As a creature of his generation, his class, the Marines, and the Justice Department, being political surely goes against every instinct he has. No, Tomaski, it's being seen as political. Bob Mueller is political in every, (laughs) every inch of his body. But he has created the image, and most people buy that perception, that he is Mr. Righteous, Mr. Rectitude. And as I've pointed out, his investigation is full of holes. It's limited hangout. He didn't finish the job in terms of obstruction. And nobody is commenting on the report based on Michael Wolff's new book, that Mueller had drafted three counts of obstruction against Donald Trump. No, Mueller got away with saying it was a department policy. We were never going to indict this guy, no matter what we discovered. And so, yes, we have seen a limited hangout investigation. Now, BuzzFeed has an irreverent take on this, and I like it. They said that Mueller really scolded Americans for not doing their assigned reading, like a college professor. (laughs) And they even found one college professor, uh, Benjamin Pauley, on Twitter. He said, as a retired college professor, I have great sympathy for Mueller. He wrote the textbook, told everyone to read it, said, yes, it's all on the test. And then the students asked for one last study session because they aren't clear what he expects. Later, the article says, during the press conference, Mueller faced the American public with the tone of a worn-down teacher who has to remind his class that all the answers are right there if they would have only done the assigned homework like they were asked to. So I reference Michael Wolff's new book. It's uh, Siege, Trump Under Fire, another excerpt in The Guardian today. And mostly they're quoting Steve Bannon, who has been exiled from Trump world. Bannon is reported to say he believes investigations of Trump's financial history will provide proof of the underlying criminality of the Trump organization. Wolf writes, Trump was vulnerable because for 40 years he had run what increasingly seemed to be, uh, seemed to resemble a semi-criminal enterprise. And he quotes Bannon as saying, I think we can drop the semi part. Wolf also quotes Bannon saying investigations into Trump's finances will cut adrift even his most ardent supporters. This is where it isn't a witch hunt. Even for the hardcore, this is where he turns into just a crooked business guy and one worth $50 million instead of $10 billion. Not the billionaire he said he was, just another scumbag. And the fallout from this whole Russiagate hysteria? is elegantly captured by my pal Yasha Levine. I've linked to his piece that's uh, published at Gray Zone the last couple of days. And he writes about being a Soviet immigrant kid in America. He 
was brought to San Francisco as a child. And he said, with that background, I've been primed to see this country as a unique beacon of tolerance, a place where bigotry and racism, if they exist at all, are banished to the far edges of society. But as an adult, I came to understand just how much bigotry and systemic racism and exclusion are ingrained in the politics and culture of modern America. And he says that the impact of all of this negative reporting about Russia and the anti-Russian hysteria parallels the early 20th century, the Red Scare of the 1950s. And he says, for nearly four years now, Soviet and Russian immigrants have watched America's liberal political elite shift the blame for their country's domestic political problems away from themselves and onto a fictitious, inscrutable foreign enemy, a xenophobic campaign that put people like us, the Russians, at the center of everything that's gone wrong in America. We've watched as this panic grew from a fear of the Russian government to an all-encompassing irrational racist conspiracy theory that put a cloud over not just Russian nationals or Russian government officials, but anyone from the lands of the former Soviet Union. Very well put. I'll see if I can catch up with Yasha. Overdue to get a, another in-depth interview from him. Want to reference an op-ed published at The Guardian in the last couple of days by Zaid Jelani? And he is uh, parked over at UC Berkeley, just across the bay from me. And he writes in support of Nancy Pelosi's refusal to impeach Trump. And Mr. Jelani, you've got it wrong. He writes, although House Democrats are frustrated by Trump's attempt to block their subpoenas and investigations of his financial dealings ar across the world... They do not have a clear-cut case of high crimes and misdemeanors that could set the stage for a successful impeachment. That is flat-out wrong. The obstruction claims from Mueller are very strong. The guilty plea from Michael Cohen about the hush money paid to Stormy Daniels and the Playboy model, those are criminal acts, and Trump is an unindicted co-conspirator. And Mueller wasn't willing to use that phrase the way the special prosecutor in Nixon's case did. So Jelani says it's important for Congress to never declare that impeachment is off the table. But what Pelosi's arguing right now is much more reasonable than 2006. She supports oversight and investigations into Trump and the president's financial dealings as a way to expose possible wrongdoing. <laughs> And then he admits the president is stonewalling some of these investigations. And then he concludes that the votes don't seem to be there for an impeachment. Quoting, opening an impeachment inquiry would start a process many Americans would see as an attempt to circumvent the 2020 election. That's not true. That is a Republican talking point. That's what Trump wants people to believe. And the guy who gets it right is this Freedom Caucus, hard right, congressman from Grand Rapids, Michigan, Justin Amash. And at the DeVos Auditorium at a high school in Grand Rapids yesterday, he hold a t held a town hall meeting. He got standing ovations. He got blistering questions from Trump supporters who hate him. But he stood his ground. He said those who have actually read the Mueller report will be appalled that Speaker Pelosi is trying to hold the majority rather than uphold the law. We can't let conduct like that go unchecked. Congress has a duty to keep the president in check, says Amash. And he's concerned that the country has reached the point where impeachment may never be used in any circumstance. Quote, that is a greater risk than the risk that it will be used too often. It is more dangerous for our country to allow a president to mislead people, make things up. And he talked about the effort by Trump to get his White House counsel, Don McGahn, to create a false record. Things like that, to me, reflect incredible dishonesty and really harm the office of the presidency. I don't think you can just let that stuff go. That's the Republican. Now, he's the only one. I acknowledge that. And I know that the, the votes aren't there now. 
But for the Democrats to believe that that is all baked into the Trump cake? I'm sorry. They are derelict in their duties. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work and my ranting and raving here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. Great people like Ford Green, who just renewed his annual, Marvin Rasmussen, Paul Karsh, Abby McMillan. They each kick in five, or in Abby's case, 20 bucks a month. You can do it, too. Visit PeterBCollins.com. Click on Menu. Click on Become a Subscriber. You'll hit the sign-up page where you can make a choice of the level of support that's comfortable for you. Julian Assange is reportedly quite ill, so sick that he couldn't coherently converse with his attorney last Friday. And Caitlin Johnstone, the Australian writer, is calling on the media saying, how come nobody is reporting this? In fact, he has been moved to the hospital wing of the Belmarsh prison. And she cites a Swedish newspaper report and the World Socialist website as the only places that she has found a mention of this. And she writes, We have been watching the slow-motion assassination of Julian Assange. They have been choking him to death by tactical psyops, siege tactics, and willful neglect as surely as if they had placed a noose, around, uh, a noose tied around his neck, not just in Belmarsh prison, but in the embassy as well. The only difference between his execution and someone on death row is the same as the difference between covert and overt warfare, which makes sense because the intelligence, judicial, and military agencies who are carrying out his death sentence operate with the same power structure which carries out war. First came the smears, propaganda, then came the siege, sanctions, and they staged their coup, dragged him out of the embassy. Now they've got him in their clutches, and they can do what they want behind closed doors. That's how you kill a nation while still looking like a nice guy, and that's how they're killing Assange. And over at Shadow Proof and also at Medium, Kevin Gostola has published a very detailed and thoughtful analysis of what he calls the contrived conspiracy theory behind the expanded indictments of Assange under the Espionage Act. And I've linked to it. I encourage you to read it because what you will find is that because Gostola covered the court-martial of then-private Bradley Manning at Fort Meade, and she provided, uh, uh, he, Kevin, provided uh, detailed coverage on this podcast at the time. And he writes, in order to defend the First Amendment and investigate journalism its, and investigative journalism itself, it's crucial to understand the timeline of events for Chelsea Manning's disclosures to WikiLeaks. And what he basically points out is that since the court-martial, the government has promoted a false theory that Manning worked for Assange, that Manning took directions and orders from Assange. And in her testimony, February 28 of 2013, she described each set of information that she grabbed and why she was inclined to release it to the public. And as we pointed out last week, out of some 78 items on a wish list that WikiLeaks published, she only supplied four of them. And so the idea that she was taking direction from Assange, and they claim that in the first indictment that was used for the initial attempt to extradite him from England, saying that he helped her illegally hack into government networks and computers. And so it's also important to note that in the court-martial, Manning was charged with aiding the enemy and also charged her with releasing video of an airstrike in Afghanistan. And she was acquitted on both of those offenses. So I encourage you to read, as I say, this detailed piece. It runs about 15 pages. And Kevin Gostola, I think, really nails it. And the underlying reason that Chelsea Manning is still locked up, despite the fact that these indictments that are based on her leaking to Assange have already been released. 
What do they need Chelsea Manning for now? Well, Gastola suggests it is an effort to get her to change her tune, change her testimony in a way that would support their false narrative. Over at The Intercept, they have dropped four big stories today under bylines of people I haven't heard of before. And all of them are based on elements from the Ed Snowden archives. There is a story about how a revolutionary U.S. intelligence mapping system made European allies complicit in targeted killings in Afghanistan, was later deployed on the U.S.-Mexico border. They also disclosed that U.S. officials drew up a new intelligence-sharing framework in response to pressure from Israeli spy bosses, that Norwegian intelligence knew about the sinking of the Russian Kursk submarine much sooner than officials have said, and that a power outage took down the NSA's nerve center one day in the summer of 2006. Now, the signal that I get from the Intercept's drop of these four big stories is that you're not going to see anything else based on the Snowden archives. They're locking it up, and it will no longer be available to the public. Kind of the same song that Bob Mueller is singing today. <laughs> That's all, folks. <laughs> you ain't going to see me again. Uh, as I mentioned, one of those stories is about a brownout at the NSA that took their systems down. The other story, based on the NSA that's in the news these days, is that Baltimore and some smaller cities are struggling to recover from a hacking-for-ransom attack. Baltimore was hacked and ordered to pay $100,000 in Bitcoin to the uh, cyber criminals. Baltimore has refused, but they are trying to deal with the eternal blue malware that originally came from the NSA. And Eternal Blue relies on vulnerabilities in Microsoft software. And whistleblowers like Russ Tice and Bill Binney have told me repeatedly that the NSA knew about vulnerabilities in American networks and software and hardware, and they didn't notify the parties who could fix it or patch it because they wanted to continue to be able to transgress at will. And so the NSA refused to notify Microsoft about how Eternal Blue found a flaw in their software for years, five years. And only after, apparently, the Baltimore attack on May 7th has this been acknowledged. And other than that, the NSA says, not my problem, even though, what, they're just uh, 50 miles down the road? at Fort Meade from Baltimore. The Democratic National Committee is announcing new criteria to try to thin the herd of the 23 or more candidates running for president. So you know about the first two debates, one later this month and then again in July. But to be invited on the stage in September, the standards are being raised. You have to show 130,000 donors, including at least 400 from 20 different states. And you have to earn 2% in four party-approved polls between late June and August. Now, I have a problem with the fundraising metrics because it becomes a pay-to-play game. But beyond that, I do understand that uh, you've got to come up with some way to limit the field and to allow voters to focus on who will become the likely nominee. And so as we look at this, the rules are being changed. And one of the uh, anomalies here is that the debate stages for the June and July debates will be split according to a complex formula intended to allocate polling leaders and underdogs in similar proportions on each stage. This may mean that Bernie Sanders won't be on the same stage with Joe Biden, the putative front runner right now. And that doesn't seem fair. We'll have to see how all that plays out. Kudos to John Brakey and his colleague, 
Susan Pinchon. They discovered that in North Carolina, if you take an absentee ballot, it is marked with a number that defeats the sanctity of the secret ballot. In North Carolina, they put a unique voter identification number on the ballot itself, and it allows election staff to see how individuals have voted. You can connect the ballot with the voter. Turns out, this happens in some jurisdictions in Texas, too. I've linked to the report. Check it out at PeterBCollins.com. As of my deadline, speaking to you right now, there is no final decision as the clock approaches midnight in Jerusalem. But Benjamin Netanyahu may have to submit to a rerun of the April 9th election because he has not been able to form a government. And they have cut off efforts for him to form coalitions because there are parties that won't collaborate with him because of the criminal investigations, the corruption investigations that he is facing. And his ability to cut a deal with the far right wing uh, headed by Avigdor Lieberman is being thwarted as well. It's too early to celebrate the possible end of of Benjamin Netanyahu's career as Prime Minister of Israel. But we can think about it. Mitch McConnell at a town hall meeting in Paducah, Kentucky yesterday was asked if a Supreme Court vacancy came up next year. What would he do? He said, oh, we'd fill it. And this proves all of the nasty comments that have been made about Mitch McConnell are accurate. He is a spineless opportunist, a man with no moral center, and a guy who celebrates his political inconsistency. Because you know what he did in blocking Obama's final nominee, Merrick Garland, to the Supreme Court in 2016. He made up a reason, but the real reason was because I control the Senate. Now he's bragging about it. And over the weekend on Memorial Day, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez got some ugly mention. This was in a tribute video at a AAA baseball game in Fresno. The Fresno Grizzlies are part of the Washington Nationals baseball uh, network. And they ran a video that featured pictures of Kim Jong-un, Fidel Castro, and AOC, listed on the screen as enemies of freedom. And this shows you how the Trump virus has descended into some of the darkest corners of America. And as the antidote, I encourage you to go to Netflix next time you have a chance and watch Knock Down the House. This is the documentary about the primary campaign by AOC or OAC, sorry, AOC, it's AOC, <laughs> and three other women who ran unsuccessfully for the House and Senate in 2018. I don't get it. I have my own bucket list, and I like to do things. But the idea that I'd pay $11,000 to climb Mount Everest and get caught in a traffic jam that could, could lead to my death or the death of other climbers, I don't get it. And finally today, across the bay in the city of Oakland, there are vigilantes who are taking to the streets after dark. They drive pickup trucks loaded with asphalt, and they have shovels and tampers. These vigilantes are taking the law into their own hands to fill the potholes in Oakland because the city isn't doing it. <laughs> you go, vigilantes. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. Share it all over the place. You'll find it on YouTube. And I'm still Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.